Okay, hello beautiful people and welcome to the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. As always, you can also find us on Brattleboro Community Television or BCTV and iTunes and Spotify. So keep an, keep an eye out for us wherever you get your podcast or other entertainment. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and as always, I am speaking with regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, who's one of three reps for the town of Brattleboro. Hello, Emily. Hello, Olga. Good morning. Good morning. And, you know, I have to say, Emily, as we have been talking about the pandemic and how it is um, highlighting what needs to be fixed in society, I have to admit, I never thought we would come around to the topic of the workplace, quite like the pandemic mm. has brought that topic to uh, the surface. And just for background for listeners, Emily showed me an essay from the New York Times, or it appeared in the New York Times by, um, I believe his name is Jonathan. I think it's pronounced Malazic. If I mispronounce that, I apologize, Jonathan. But it's an essay from his forthcoming book, The End of Burnout. And it was called, The Future of Work Should Mean Working Less. And it just dove into all the different ways the work world or the job world or the employment world or the money-making world, however you wanna call it, just is not working for people. And Emily, I know work and dignity and workers' rights is, are big for you. What did this essay at this point in time bring up for you? Oh, Olga, it, um, it really reinforced so many of the ideas that have been bubbling to the surface. So I've been working a lot, as you know, um, and as we've discussed previously, um, recently on unemployment insurance. And there are these conversations um, brewing all over the country, including in Vermont, about how unemployment insurance benefits aren't sufficient for folks who are out of work and that people aren't going back to work fast enough. Um, and I'm appreciative of the few folks I know who can sort of hold both of those realities, right? And mm -hmm. I have some colleagues who can across the aisle actually. And um, when we talk about it, the question is why aren't people going back to work? And it's mm -hmm. not because the social service system isn't kicking them out on their ass soon enough. Right. And I, again, really appreciate the broad agreement that I think I've seen with my colleagues in Vermont on that like very clear line in the sand. The problem is not that the social service system is too good. That is not why people aren't going to work. People aren't going to work because it was barely working before the pandemic. I think we were all intensely frayed at the edges before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, white collar workers were working 70 hours a week. Um, folks who worked sort of away from desks, blue collar, pink collar, whatever color collar, um, service workers were working multiple jobs with unsteady schedules for not enough money, being treated often terribly. And then the pandemic happened and it got even harder, right? Mm -hmm. Like childcare got that much harder. Obtaining groceries got that much harder. You know, like it just took that much longer. The thing wasn't in the store. And we were all so much more stressed. And so people were even ruder to the folks who were providing services to them or um, conflict arose so much more easily or people started taking their, their things out at work or people had to like come home after a 12 hour shift and then spend an hour decontaminating. And I think we all, so, so many of us reached a breaking point mm -hmm. and can't quite get our hand around what going back would even look like, um, how that's even possible. With child, you know, childcare for anyone who has tried to um, work anything close to a regular job with, kids under the age of 18, there 
even a salary job with benefits never provides enough vacation time to actually line up with the amount of time your child is out of school, right? Mm -hmm. And the school day never, ever matches the hours at the job you have, ever. Right. No. And no. It's just wild, like the incredible mismatch that we have across our lives that we try to piece together. And what this, what this essay highlighted for me is just like how many people have said no more and retired early um, or just can't find their way back. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's people are saying, I'd rather live in poverty than do that. I think people are saying, I can't fathom how to do that. I just mm -hmm. like can't get my head around it anymore. And so in Vermont, I'm really like sharing an essay with you on this, Olga. Um, I think in Vermont, you know, I hear from so many employers too about like, you know, everywhere you go, there's signs on the door um, mm -hmm. or, you know, reduced hours or um, reduced services or people can't get enough employees. And I think what I'm starting to get to, and there was also a really great essay in Digger about the foods, about someone who'd worked in food service their whole life and was saying like, mm -hmm. why would I go back? Um, yep, yep. And so I think we really like, this is, I'm hopeful, um, you know, we know wages have gone up in this time, but I'm hopeful that there's more than that, that we can really rethink that this is the time to rethink like, what is a shift? What does a shift look like? How many shifts maybe do we need so that people can get, you know? Yeah, so that's, that's all of it for me. <laughs> I was mulling this over this morning. And, and for me, it's, it's highlighted what a, a point of transition I feel we're in. And, and the pandemic I, I feel has created a lot of transitions personal, cultural, societal, across the board for, for many people. And I'm one of those folks who in the pandemic changed jobs. Congratulations. In part <laughs> because um, I needed a little more support. Um, and I also, um, I was thinking too about transitions, how important it is to get them right um, and not just go back to the same old, same old. Because part of me, this is just a personal belief, but I'm not sure transitions happen unless something needs to change. I, I think quite often transitions happen because of forces outside our control. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was reading through the, the essay, they have a number of quotes that the New York Times staff gathered from people about, I'm never going back to being the last parent to pick up my kids from school or something like that. And how much those comments also reminded me um, of comments made from people who are going through grief after the loss of a loved one. Hmm. And it's forcing them to kind of reevaluate their life. And that too brings me back to transitions and about how important it is for us to get whatever we change in the workplace really needs to be for the better and to be more supportive because um, these changes that people are coming to or these realizations are people are coming to are not necessarily easy one. You know, they, they, they're coming at the end of a very long experience for a lot of people. And I think we almost, um, this essay talks a lot about dignity and I almost feel that part of a dignified response is making sure that, that we change things for the better. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing this essay brought up for me is a conversation I recently had with my stepdad, who, when I made the transition to this new job, day job, I call it, because I still do my freelance work, I specifically chose to go to 32 hours. And one of the reasons was, is my dad's going through some health needs. And so almost one day a week, almost, I am doing something for his health care. And we had this conversation recently about his concerns about what this means for my financial life and how there isn't really much that will make up whatever those eight hours of wages mm -hmm. that I'm not earning from my day job because I'm helping him. Um, and, 
that conversation is ongoing, but again, I think it highlights so often how we have to make these choices. And sometimes the choices that are better for us and better for the people we love. And I feel if you're making those choices, probably better for society overall, they, they so often can come at an economic cost mm -hmm. and, and how frustrating and unfair that can feel sometimes. Mm -hmm. I am um, also was, um, well, I was laid off during pandemic, pandemic, you really? left your job voluntarily. Um, yes. And <laughs> I, um, I don't know, you know, it's, it's a transition that is, um, you know, it's a transition yep. nevertheless, True. and had a lot of grief and a lot of curiosity and a lot of fear. Um, and I think actually, you know, talking to you about your own transition, you also had grief and curiosity and fear. Yes, um, definitely. And then, you know, I met with my former, um, director a couple last week, I think. And I, I thanked him. And I know that's huge privilege that I got to thank him. Um, but I was, a lot becomes available when transitions are thrust upon us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's true for employers right now, just as much as employees. And so, you know, I was, um, talking to a friend yesterday who also, um, became a single mother um, quite unexpectedly when her child was young. And we were talking about how the fact that we had both um, experienced really profoundly deep economic and social crisis mm -hmm. um, and then sort of come out the other side. Um, we sort of, we knew that we'd be, we both had the security of knowing we'd be okay through transitions because of that. Um, and I recognize that there's a lot of privilege in that, that, you know, I didn't have, crisis it crises every six months or every three months or every year I had a period a long period of constant crisis and then um have really had a lot of stability since then um partly because of a new partnership and you know heterosexual relationships bring a lot of stability to women's lives um and men's lives too um so anyway really spinning out here but <laughs> um my point is the question of employers, like employees are saying, I can't, I just can't, like I want to, and I can't, I have been pushed to the edge and I've gone past it. And I see that I can't go back because mm -hmm. my kid's childcare is less stable because my parent is more sick because the healthcare system is even harder to access. Um, and so there's all of that. And then there's employers um, who are also in crisis Mm -hmm. And I see that they don't have the space to step outside of crisis because they haven't been laid off, right? right. They haven't been forced to go home because of COVID. Um, so they're still in the thick of it. They're still in the crisis, don't have the space for reflection. And so yeah. the question is, how can we, my question, um, mm -hmm. that was the question, my question is that as a lawmaker, how can I support employers to make the transitions that they need to in order to have an adequate workforce? Um, yeah. Because I know that they're not gonna be able to make all those decisions themselves in the state of crisis. And so, you know, the other day I was driving past a mill that I drive past a lot and they're always hiring and they were hiring before the pandemic and they're still hiring. And um, I just wondered like, what if all of their shifts were six hours? Mm -hmm. Like what if that was just the default, a six hour shift? Like, what would that, how would that change for who, who walked in the door? Um, who yeah. would think that is possible and this other thing isn't possible? Like those little tweaks, how many folks might go back to food service if they knew that they had guaranteed pay or guaranteed hours? Um, or if they knew that they had a right to, um, you know, ban a sexually harassing customer, right? Like what, what can we do to create frameworks where the balance feels more possible for everyone in the system, yeah. right? Well, I think that is such an important question, Emily, because in many ways, in, in, the, in the spirit of transitions, it is important that we, we support um, employers to make this transition because if we don't, then, you know, they're still watching their overhead tick over and their bills haven't gone away. 
And so if we don't support them through a transition to whatever the next new possibility is, then they have no other um, reason than to try to recreate what was supporting them mm-hmm. and paying their bills before the transition started. Mm-hmm. You know, to rubber band back to whatever was. Yeah. You know, the um, on Labor Day and um, May Day, the, that sort of graphic, that really beautiful woodblock graphic floats around, which is, you know, eight hours for work, eight hours mm-hmm. for play, eight hours for rest. And that's, um, I wish I knew who made that woodblock. It's so beautiful. And we, um, we don't have that anymore. Mm-hmm. And part of the reason we don't have that anymore is because women aren't at home supporting the rest. Um, mm-hmm. So it's, you know, the eight hours of work is usually more than eight hours of work at somewhere that someone is sort of paying you that owns the means of production. And then the eight hours that would be play are usually spent at homework, whether mm-hmm. that's getting home or cleaning the house or cooking food or, or taking care of children or whatever it is. Um, and what was called play, um, and actually I'm gonna, and then that eight hours of rest, I read another really fantastic essay recently about how um, it's a term that actually, a uh, sort of phrase that originated in China, but it's called re- revenge procrastination. Mm. Um, and how those of us who don't have enough rest that we feel like all of our hours are given over to um, either service to family or service to an employer, um, will do really ridiculous things with our time in order to sort of steal it back. Um, And that often involves like doom scrolling when you should be sleeping, right? But for some reason, the doom scrolling feels like so necessary and possible, um, or like, you know, looking at makeup videos on Instagram or like whatever it is. I might have Mm -hmm. told everyone way too much about myself. But um, (laughs) mine was binge binge watching TV. Yeah, totally. When I was, I I totally love that. That that was the first sign that I needed to make a change was I was revenge procrastinating, totally. Revenge procrastination. And like, (laughs) it's activities that sap your will to live, that sap your energy, but you keep on doing them because you have not enough energy to actually make a different choice. Yep. And that, so like even the rest has been we've taken it from ourselves or it's been taken from us um, in the way we're living now. And what's called play, I think in those sort of like divided arenas, um, that's not, I mean, I guess for some people that might be like out playing ball on the neighborhood softball team, Um, Mm -hmm. but that's also just like talking with friends or volunteering or like showing up at a community meeting to learn something like, that's adult learning that play. And so what it takes from our communities when we don't have that play time is we don't have the time to gather or gather mm-hmm. purposefully with each other to um, share and create. Yeah. Um, what you're saying it makes me think of uh, some concepts in feng shui, which I think I've mentioned to you before that in feng shui, everything works on five elements. Mm -hmm. And they go in the order of water, wood, fire, earth, metal. And when, when I was learning about these elements and how they work together, one thing that really hit me is that each of these elements, if you follow them around in the creative cycle, they start with inspiration and, and like an unformed idea or thought or emotion, which is water, and then circle around to metal, which is actually rest and refinement that you kind of stop and and look at what you've done and you process it and you reflect before you go on to the next cycle. And it's it's really hit me this past year how often in our lives we we don't do that full cycle. Like we are just kind of going straight. I'm not even sure we go through water sometimes. We're just like wood is about resources and production and projects and growing and then fire is about action and earth is about making it real sometimes i think we're just in those three and we're not actually doing the full stop reflect um see what needs to change and grow and move and then go on to the next one 
And um, when you don't do that, like in feng shui, you end up with an unbalanced environment is essentially what happens. And if an, an, an environment is unbalanced, it can lead to illness. Mm -hmm. And so, and there is, there's so much illness. Um, I'm, I mean, honestly, I'm not always as hopeful on Fridays as I am on Mondays. And we usually talk on Fridays, Olga, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna look for my Monday morning hopefulness right now. Um, and think about sort of what this future of work might look like that, you know, I think a lot of people have been talking about for a long time pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. that the pandemic made feel almost inevitable for a little while, um, then felt right now still feels far away, but the actual work we have isn't working, right? Mm -hmm. The workforce shortage we have here is not, um, is not the same workforce shortage we had four years ago in Vermont. Mm -hmm. A very different workforce shortage. Um, mm -hmm. Could you, sorry, back up a little bit, because we have been talking about the workforce shortage so much in Vermont. Mm -hmm. I'd love if you could differentiate a little bit for folks why they're different. Mm -hmm. So um, historically in Vermont, there's been a big fear about workforce shortages. And some of that um, was about sort of how many more folks sort of on the retirement end of their careers we have than folks on the emerging end of their careers. Mm -hmm. um, and so that looking at that balance of human capital was really, really scary for people. Um, we also had very, few, we've always had very few folks who were officially unemployed in Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, and that is actually mostly because of the way the federal labor department defines yeah. unemployed. And I think we've talked about that before, but essentially okay. it means that you are, um, have left a full-time job and you're actively looking for a new full-time job. And Vermont has never been a state that um, was as focused on full-time work as a lot of other states. Mm -hmm. Um, because people piece together multiple part-time jobs. And so you yeah. would be included, underemployed people are not included in those numbers. And then um, because of the childcare crisis, we also had a lot of women that were um, not working pre-pandemic mm -hmm. um, who are also not counted as unemployed. So that was sort of the, but the biggest, so, and those things are all true still. Mm -hmm. But the biggest part of the labor shortage that people were really focused on previously was sort of a skill mismatch. Um, that employers, and I can't, we really haven't talked about this in quite a while, but we have talked about it before. We have, but yeah, it's, it's yeah. probably been at least a year maybe, mm -hmm. yeah. And so the skill mismatch was that, you know, in 2020, 2019, um, employers really expected something that they did not expect historically, which is that employees would come to them with all the skills they needed to do the job that they did, right? Yeah. And that's not how work has um, existed sort of in the history of industrial America, mm -hmm. um, industrial America, I think, you know, even through the 80s and maybe even early 90s, um, employers were quite willing to train someone with sort of a very broad swath of almost skills and say like, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I would say a lot of places had different levels of jobs too, where you could start like literally at entry level and then work your way up. And that was almost a form of training. Yes. And progression as well. Yeah. And part of it is because of Vermont's very much smaller businesses. There's a lot less of opportunity. There's a lot of, um, there's not a lot of movement within a mm -hmm. single employer in Vermont because of how small the businesses are. Um, and part of it is that our very small employers don't have the capacity for training that a large employer would. Right. And so there was a lot of sort of looking to the state to do that training and um, a lot of disconnects between our education system and our career training system that needed work. And so a lot of those things, um, and then there was, you know, some people who thought that Vermont had a, had a shrinking population. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
those things are still somewhat true. There's still the disconnect between sort of graduates and careers, um, but it's not actually that many people that are sort of caught in that disconnect, um, which means one, it's a solvable problem because it's really only a few people. Mm -hmm. And two, it's not actually like the problem at the scale that we're looking at it now. Okay. Um, so now we just have people who have left the workforce. And some of that is, you know, parents at home taking care of their children. Um, that's a lot of it. A lot of it is folks taking care of sick, other sick folks in their family or other people in need of caretaking. Um, a lot of it is people who have left the workforce because of health concerns, right? It's that I don't feel safe in my work. Right. And that's not something that people did before. Though there were a lot of people who didn't feel safe in their workplace before. Um, Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. And so that's more sort of the workforce shortage that we have in front of us right now. Um, it's the people who can't make it work. And then the last piece that we don't talk about that much in Vermont um, is all of the folks who are experiencing mental health and substance use challenges, um, who have worked before and aren't working now and are in treatment um, or not in treatment, but the workplace really um, is not able to accommodate what they need in terms of mental health or substance use support because mm -hmm. of, again, hours and schedules and flexibility. Um, yeah. And so that's a really other, and then also insurance, but I don't know if we need to get into that right now. Um, so <laughs> that's a whole other can of worms. A whole other can of worms. Um, but that's a really interesting piece of this whole puzzle, given that we have really like a whole generation of folks um, who experience substance use. Mm -hmm. So we're just about out of time in this first half, but before I derailed you asking about workforce shortages, you said you were going to try to find some of your Monday hopefulness <laughs> to share. <laughs> Did you find it or do we need to circle back to it? <laughs> um, I found it in that like we thought this thing was very possible at the beginning of the pandemic and then it didn't feel like anything was going to change and now again it feels like it feels like change is possible it feels like the state is going to need to support employers to adjust to this um to adjust to the needs of workers it feels like that's the only way out of this situation is for employers to adjust to the needs of workers. And that is such a profound rebalancing that has such far reaching impacts for how we understand the economy mm. or how we have understood the economy for the last 30 years, mm -hmm. um, for how we understand GDP and all of our other economic metrics. It's a really like, it's a really interesting, like I said, a rebalancing um, that I don't think we've seen the likes of since the fifties. And I'm so curious. Mm -hmm. And isn't it exciting that we get to be a part of it? Yeah. So the Montpelier Happy Hour folks will return in a moment. We're just going to hear from some of our underwriters, but stay tuned. Emily and I shall return. Welcome back to this second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Bradbrook your community radio station. If you're just joining us, I am your host, Olga Peters, and I'm sp speaking with regular contributor and representative Emily Kornheiser. Hello, Emily. Hi, Olga. Welcome back. And what do we need to remind listeners of? The views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests, and not the radio station or the TV station or whatever platform they're being streamed upon. Why, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so Emily and I have been talking about the nature of the workplace. Po kind of, well, keep, I keep wanting to say post-pandemic, but ongoing pandemic. I like to say this phase of the pandemic. Very nice, the, this thank phase you. of the pandemic. And we have been inspired, this conversation has been inspired in part by an essay that appeared in the New York Times called The Space to Re, uh, sorry, the few, that, those were my notes. The future of work should mean working less. Um, and it will be part of a forthcoming book called The End of Burnout. So Emily, with your legislative hat on, mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit about some of the conversations that are happening in the legislature. And I'm also curious if you know this, you may not, 
but are there laws around labor in Vermont that maybe might need to change if we want employers to make some of these changes? Mm -hmm. um, so again, we're out of session. So there are no like actual laws moving right. around right now, right? Um, but some conversations and ideas that I will um, sprinkle throughout our conversation. <laughs> um, and then maybe I can like list a handful of them and you can pick one for us to dive deeper in first. Does that sound good? Okay, that okay. sounds good. So there are conversations about um, our career technical education system, how it connects to our other workforce training systems, what or what not the Department of Labor's role in this is, and um, we put a huge amount of money into these scholarships, these sort of COVID scholarships for the state college and community college system mm -hmm. that were snapped up like overnight. Um, and so there's a lot of questions about like, what does that mean and where, how can we put more money in there? Um, there are questions around how we qualify people as employees or not employees and what that means for both employers and employees mm -hmm. um, including sort of what means full-time and what does what do full-time and part-time mean and there are both tax implications for that and um, sort of fee implications for that um, that's all very interesting mm -hmm. there are questions around what benefits um, and this is something we've talked about so much <laughs> what benefits um, can be provided at the public level to take that benefit burden both off of employers so that they can pay more in wages and um, off of employers so that employers um, that do provide benefits aren't in a um, difficult price competitive position with employers who don't provide benefits. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so there's yeah. that question as well. Um, so those are sort of probably the biggest three things um, that are sitting with mm -hmm. me right now on this. I would love to dive in a little bit into about classifying workers, mm -hmm. because that is something that is someone who has worked mul multiple jobs in this state has been tough for me at times. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine, I have seen employers struggle with how to classify workers very honestly. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I do this to, to be in compliance with the law and serve my, my workers? I've also seen some employers classify people so they could get around other things, mm, yeah. like benefits, mm -hmm. um, which to me as an employee always felt a little bit nefarious. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would love just to, on a selfish level, dive into that one. Mm -hmm. So um, broad strokes, when someone is classified as an employee, they are protected by all of the labor laws that um, we've been fighting for and putting in place in this country for the last hundred something years. And if they're not classified as an employee, they're not. So it's easier to have someone who's not classified as an employee because you just give them money for their work and they carry on. And as someone who right now is working as a consultant, um, I am not classified as an employee. There's also things that I um, find that I kind of love about it. Like I don't feel attached to my employer and subject to my employer and all of these things, even though I'm totally bound. And like, if they let me go tomorrow, I wouldn't know how to pay my bills, but somehow it gives me this like magical feeling of freedom, mm -hmm. um, which is a total mirage. And in some ways feels almost like that revenge procrastination that I'm like stealing freedom from capitalism that I don't actually have because of some like, <laughs> weird organizational association. And that is so like, I think that's core to the Vermonter identity, that whole idea. Yeah. Okay. And, and freelancing, just to be upfront, yes. freelancing makes me feel the same way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what's interesting is the way the state of Vermont pursues employers who are misclassifying 
um, is that it's on a complaint driven basis. And so mm -hmm. if someone has consented to be misclassified, which is what most of us who are misclassified do, either because it's the only way we can get a job at that place and we think it's going to lead to more and better or we need a job or whatever, or we have this like bizarre magical freedom narrative that we've created, which again, I've created too. So like, you know, no digs on anyone else who has created the freedom narrative. But um, if someone consents to being misclassified, there's really very little remedy at the state mm -hmm. level for um, either supporting or penalizing employers to find their way through that, which is still illegal to misclassify. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. actually matter if you consent or not, you're still misclassified. Um, and if you're doing work for an employer that is sort of part of the core work of that employer's, you're supposed to be an employee. Um, and so that's a really interesting part of that. And there's all kinds of different sort of pay rules and tax rules and all kinds of things woven into that that um, makes it easier and harder for employers and employees in both cases that could use some more attention and tweaking than they get. And within that whole realm, there's the part-time full-time that also has all of those rules attached to it. Mm -hmm. um, that I think we could do some good work to not um, incentivize people. Um, the, there's no need to create a category between part-time and full-time. You either work somewhere or you don't. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we don't need to penalize someone who's working 30 hours a week by not giving, not, you know, requiring that they receive certain benefits, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's that whole that world that I think is really important and something that we could look at more. Okay. What, um... the other sort of in that same land, I'm sorry, I jumped. Oh, no, go ahead, go, go for it. Yeah. Um, is worker safety things, mm -hmm. um, right? And so we know that a lot of folks aren't working right now because they don't feel safe at work. Mm -hmm. And we know historically people have worked when they didn't feel safe at work, but the, the level of unsafety is much higher now, right? Yeah. But when the state imposes worker safety guidelines, like say universal inside mask mandates, um, which we desperately need right now, or um, ensures that workers comp policies support something and incentivize something like universal mask mandates, then employers, um, don't have to navigate all of that themselves. It takes the pressure off of them. They can say, it's not me that's making you wear a mask even though it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's the state. And the people who really want to be wearing a mask at work aren't in a position of navigating all of those interpersonal struggles with their colleagues and their supervisors and not knowing if it's gonna be upheld or not upheld because it's an essential part of sort of worker safety the same way someone wears boots on a construction site. Right. Um, and so that's, and people wear boots on a construction site because the person on the construction site is liable if they cut their toes off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the Department of Labor actually provides boots to people who are going to a construction site for the first time. And in the same way, the state could be providing masks and antigen tests to employers so that they could make that sort of, make that step themselves as in addition to the real need for universal mask mandates. And so that's one scenario that's sort of pandemic specific, but you can see how it applies to um, a different phase of the pandemic or a post pandemic future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Um, just as a, a side note, a, a little cheeky side note, um, to talk about next phase of the pandemic. I don't know about you, but now when I have stress dreams about something, it usually involves me being someplace and I can't find my mask. Me too. <laughs> um, <Yep. laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. Historically, my stress dreams have always been, and I have not worked in food service for probably 10 years now, but my stress dreams always, always have been that I am waiting tables somewhere and I either can't figure out which tables are in my section 
or I am stuck at a table in my section and everyone else really wants me, but this like one person in front of me will not stop talking and I can't get away from them. Or there's a really, really, really long distance between the kitchen and the tables I'm serving and I'm trying to carry food and I can't go fast enough. So those are my usual stress streams, which are also like super work, say like, you know, they're like definitely like work stress streams, but it's so funny. Mine are always now, like, it's not that I'm naked and I'm not supposed to be naked. It's that like, all of a sudden, mm-hmm. I'm not wearing a mask. Yeah, yep. so good. My stress dreams historically are I'm in a car and either I'm driving down a windy road with like lots of pedestrians or houses close to the road or I'm in traffic and the brakes go out. And I'm trying to navigate this car and it's picking up speed and I'm risking, I'm, I'm in danger of hitting people or hitting other cars, that's that's always my stress dream. But now, yes, it's trying to go into some place and can't find my mask. Um, so the pandemic, it just reaches all parts of our lives. Emily, are there other labor laws or ways of doing business in Vermont that you think folks should understand to greater understand this kind of transition and, and where we hope we can go to? So the other piece is sort of those social services or um, employee benefits that can be provided by the state rather than by individual employers. Mm -hmm. And so that's supporting child care um, and supporting child care at many, many different times of day. Mm -hmm. So people could work, say, these magical six hour shifts or split shifts or whatever and still have their child care work. Um, Or second or third shift even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Our fourth shift, you know, mm-hmm. if each shift is six hours, we'll need four of them, right? There you go. Good point. Um, so it's, you know, it's family medical leave that, mm-hmm. you know, what we see when family medical leave is provided is that people don't exit their jobs when they have a health need or a family care need. They stay and then they come back. And it's incredibly expensive to employers to hire and, re- and train yeah. a new employee. It is so much less expensive if that person is able to be retained through a leave period. So family medical leave is huge. Um, childcare is huge. Um, unemployment insurance that also covers um, self-employed people mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. could be really incredible. And we saw that you know, um, through PUA that really helps people find their way in a lot of ways, that security that can be provided can help people start new businesses or um, find something that's flexible enough to sort of meet their family's needs and their own needs, Um, helps artists make more time for art, those kinds of things, or have the security to make art. Mm -hmm. Um, And so those are other ways the state can really sort of intercede in order to support a transformation of work. Yeah. I, I've always been surprised, especially given how so many Vermonters cobble together multiple jobs. I do wish we had a better way of having benefits follow workers rather than follow employers. So that, uh, just an example, and I've used this example before, but it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. You know, when I am now on, on employer-sponsored healthcare, but when I was on Vermont Health Connect or going through Vermont Health Connect, as an individual market, Um, you know, my income based on my freelancing and such would go up and down month to month. And if I was really adhering to the rules of of Health Connect, then every month I would call them up and they would do an income adjustment. Who, like- No one has time. uh, Health Connect doesn't have time for that. Nobody has time for that. And, and so, yeah, that, that just always made me wish that there were, there were benefits that could follow me as a worker rather than, than with employees and, and could actually understand those ups and downs that being self-employed or freelancing could, could create. And in a state like Vermont, I never understood why we don't have those things. Mm-hmm. Um, but and so, <laughs> yeah, and really want to, you know, put in a plug that if the Build Back Better infrastructure bill, you know, the second one that's in um, 
the reconciliation bill. If that passes, we're gonna be able to do all those things. Like fairly wow. easily. And mm -hmm. what Vermont has, you know, this last session, we put a whole bunch of bills in play to sort of get the landscape ready for when that money is here. Um, and so, you know, with my colleague, Robin Shai, I sponsored a really strong universal family medical leave bill mm -hmm. that's really sitting on the wall waiting for that federal money to come to help us jumpstart it. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. our childcare system is like primed and ready for this enormous cash infusion at the moment we have like all the enabling legislation in place. Um, and we are actively working on this sort of UI task force about what can be the future of our unemployment system if our IT system could be upgraded. And mm -hmm. so all of these, like all of these pieces feel so close right now. And there's just like these two senators. <laughs> <laughs> that's not fair okay because I just I just went into this is actually a thing that both the media and all the humans do that drives me nuts it's not just those two senators it's all the Republican senators too mm -hmm. and so when like a Democrat breaks ranks it's like all on that Democrat that broke ranks but like there's also all the other people who are voting no who are also right. who don't want us to take care of our yeah. needs so excuse me for that <laughs> So we have just about 10 minutes before the end of this, this segment. I want to shift a little bit to, especially in Vermont, the concept of quality of life. Mm -hmm. Because quite often, you and I have talked to no end about how wages are pretty, pretty sad in Vermont, especially when you compare us to other New England states or our mm -hmm. neighbor, New York. And but we hear the argument in favor of those crappy wages for, I wonder if I can say that on the radio, I just did, um, <laughs> uh, is well, you get this great quality of life. And it's the Vermont tax that if you live in Vermont, you just know that it's such a wonderful place to live that you don't mind those lower wages, um, which never really held water for me because I see all the ways that Vermont suffers from people not being able to um, afford their lives, basically. But I would love to try to connect that concept of quality of life, if that really is a goal that we as Vermonters have, then how does that connect to what's happening now for you as a, legislature, a legislator with some of these transitions happening around the workplace? Well, I think that if, as we reopen or open back up or make this next step, if the we- The next phase. Whatever it is. The next phase of the next phase. Yeah. <laughs> if we can find a way to have the six hour workday pay what the eight hour workday did, right? Mm -hmm. um, if part-time work can feel more possible, um, if, you know, one of, we could work part-time and then do an extra project that like drives our hearts and pays us. Um, or volunteer for all those town committees that are desperate for volunteers because we yeah. operate on volunteerism in so many ways. We do, but if that volunteerism acknowledged that people can't afford to volunteer, what would that look like, right? Mm -hmm. So the Brattleboro Select Board now pays a stipend if someone needs to pay for any um, care while they're serving. Yeah. Yep, dependent care dependent care and um, pays enough to actually sort of cover the time that you're working there. If we did that more often, if the legislature paid enough, um, if, you know, being very cognizant yesterday of the folks who are sort of in um, party leadership in whatever party it is, do a huge amount of work sort of outside of committee to keep us all running in the same direction. And they don't get paid mm -hmm. for any of that. Um, and that's like a full time, you know, all year round job. So if all of those pieces um, could acknowledge what we each need to make it work, um, mm -hmm. and that sort of phrase making it work, like government needs to work for people, employers need to make sure that work 
makes the rest of someone's life possible. Um, and the folks who are showing up to work, you know, can also acknowledge that they're making sort of whatever the workplace is run. Um, mm -hmm. But if we all had just a little bit more space, just a little bit more space, then I think we all could have that capacity to not feel, you know, drowning in the scarcity and the panic, um, but to sort of step into that. I don't know if I answered your question because I don't remember what your question was anymore. It, it was very, well, it was, it was pretty broad mm -hmm. and it was pretty nebulous. And that is, um, I'll just rephrase it in case it shakes something loose for you. We, we talk about one of the hallmarks of Vermont being quality of life. Mm -hmm. But I would say in our work lives, that's not always true. And in our, our wage lives, that's not always true. Mm -hmm. So how can we make this world of work align with that idea of Vermont as having a very high quality of life? Yeah, I think it's those things. I think it's also, um, I don't know how much this lines up with this work conversation, but I think it's really, really important to say, and it's something that Chris Campany is really eloquent about um, the director of our, um, the Wyndham Regional Commission, is that what it's called? Yes, yep. yeah. That was weird. Um, Regional Planning Commission. The, and that's um, that our recreational spaces um, aren't for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about a quality of life, but a lot of folks in Vermont don't have ready access to either the sort of side of outside recreation that, um, features prominently in our marketing materials. Mm -hmm. um, or we have very few public spaces and places and things to do inside here. Mm -hmm. um, most of our recreation is like really quite privatized in Vermont and more and more of our open lands and open landscape is posted. And so quality of life also means that we have places and spaces to gather outside of our homes. Um, and I think that's really part of whatever. I think we've all realized from the pandemic how important gathering is now yeah. that it's mostly gone. Um, connection, yeah. Yeah, that connection. And so when I think about quality of life, I also think a lot about our ability to gather um, and mm -hmm. that how much that's enabled by infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Very, very good point. Well, thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I am looking forward to seeing, you know, we have a lot on the horizon. You mentioned the, the funding package that's at the federal level right now that's being considered. Mm -hmm. A lot of towns are starting to consider what to do with their ARPA funds and some of the public processes and public meetings around ARPA funds have, have started. Yeah. So I, do a show I that really soon, right? Just listeners, we're gonna do a show about the town level ARPA funding soon. Right? I hope so. I okay. hope so. I think we're still deciding who we're going to reach out to for yes. that one. But that's a plan. Yes. That's yeah. A plan, plan. Yeah. I think we were hoping for some of the public process to start. Yes. So we would have some conversations to draw from. And I'm excited. I mean, you were talking about your, your Monday morning hopefulness and my Friday morning hopefulness is that people, we will finally be able to re realize some of the, the hopes and dreams and wants that we've had in the works and kind of cooking on the back burner now that some of the funding's coming through. Mm -hmm. And I hope we will continue to, to dream big and, and push the envelope on some of that. Hey, Emily, if folks want to find out more about you or find out what you've been up to, where can they find you? Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org where you can find links to all of my glorious social media accounts, to this podcast actually, and to email and phone numbers and all of those things, as well as semi-regular updates on when I'm in the news or any newsletters I send out. Um, but I have been without interns this summer. And so all of those things will be updated real soon with my new glorious crop of UVM interns. Yay. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. Well, as always, you can find the Montpelier Happy Hour at our Facebook page. 
at the Montpelier happy hour .captivate .fm. That's our website, as well as iTunes and Spotify and BCTV and your public access station near you. Have a great weekend, everyone. We'll be back next week.